Welcome to the Rebooting Business Podcast, where we discuss how businesses can reboot, rebuild, and come back bigger and stronger than ever before in a post-COVID-19 reality. And now, here's your host, David Summerfleck. And hello, my name is David Summerfleck, and thank you for listening or watching um, our latest episode of Rebooting Business. This is the podcast where we discuss how business owners and the families who run them can reboot and rebuild in a post-COVID-19 economy. This is episode number 27. This episode is sponsored by the Digital Marketing Specialists online at dms.blue. And my guest today is Johanna Lyman. Yes. Hi, David. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Can you please start with your own background and education and professional experience? Because you do so much that I want to start with the basics. And that's why I wanted to talk to you because I thought it was very, very interesting and very relevant. Yeah, thanks, David. I have a very varied background. Um, went to the University of Massachusetts for my undergrad. I knew when I was nine years old, I wanted to be a buyer for a department store. So I went into fashion marketing and ended up doing that for about 10 years. It was not at all what my nine-year-old thought it was, but I loved it. Um, And then went on the wholesale side for a couple of years and and then switched industries because I had gotten very discouraged by the lack of integrity in the retail wholesale markets. So I became a certified financial planner because I thought, well, folks who are managing other people's money, they have to have integrity, right? <laughs> you so would hope. Not so much. Yeah. Uh, not all of them, but it was. I was shocked and call me naive, but shocked by how many of the financial advisors, the very first thing they looked at is what's my payout? What's my commission on this? Rather than taking a long-term approach that that if if I do a good job for my clients over the years, like it's a win-win. Not only that, but you can actually do an honest job and still earn a respectable wage. Absolutely, and be able to sleep at night. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So after about sixteen years in corporate America and and leaving three different companies because my ethics were just higher than the ethics of the organizations I worked with. Um, I decided I was probably unemployable. And so I became, I got certified as a coach and hung up my shingle in beginning of 2005. And um, over the years, my business grew and changed as, as I grew more skilled and had different interests. And, um, but I've been in the world of coaching slash consulting for small business owners since uh since 2012 so going on eight almost nine years now um and i really and it wasn't until 2013 that i found the book conscious capitalism by raj sasodia and john Mackey, Mm -hmm. and that was my sort of eureka moment where i realized there are people like me there are folks who are interested in doing well as they do good, that want their business to be a force for good in the world. They're not thinking about the next quarter's profits. They're really taking a long lens on that. And right. and that just felt like home to me. So that book really resonated with you. Yes. Yeah, for sure. I, I would have to say that the four agreements really resonated with me, probably oh, on that too. level. Um, yeah. That really... I could really relate to that. And I always recommend that. And as far as marketing, of course, I want to recommend my own book. But in all honesty, um, uh, Book Yourself Solid is one of my favorite marketing books. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. I also really like, especially for folks who are or consider themselves creative. I, I think we're all creative, but not everyone self-identifies that way. Yeah. Stephen, Stephen Pressfield's books are fantastic. He's got The War of Art. And then there's another one. Oh, shoot. The name just escaped 
just escaped me, but Stephen Pressfield, he's, he's phenomenal. And his premise on both of these books that I'm thinking of is really like, you, your job is to do your work yes. and make it available for other people. Like how people respond to it is frankly none of your business. And that was really powerful for me to hear when I was new in business. Yeah, and I think as you, as you get older, I think, and I can only speak from my own experience on this, so I'm probably just talking about myself basically, is to try to refine you know, what, what is your voice or how has your voice changed? You know, because I'm always drawn between my love of reading and writing, but I also have the love of creative endeavor as well. I, I love digital marketing. I love what it can do for business owners, but there's also, I could also really enjoy just sitting with a good book for several hours or, <laughs> Me too. you know, or putting together a course taking two weeks to put together a course yeah, and just, okay, here it is. I've done that. And I, I guess wanting to work more slowly and more methodically, more deliberately, as opposed to working more. Absolutely. And I think now more than ever, particularly as we record this, we're five months into most of us sheltering in place, 5 million cases of COVID, 165 plus thousand deaths, yeah. you know, so there is, there is an understandable urge to get out there and do something, you know, make something happen. But I think, and I, and I got this from uh, a very wise friend of mine, Akaya Winward, who said like, now is, if you think about the seasons and if you're a gardener at all, right. like now is not, we're not, harvesting the fruits of our labors right now we're tilling the soil we're choosing our seeds like who do we want to be what do we want to offer once the world reopens and i'm not going to say back to normal or a new normal because pet peeve there like no, we weren't normal before the way we were operating was extremely dysfunctional which is one of the reasons that i do the work that i do yeah, and I mean, just solely from a technical perspective, you know, the irony is like I was talking to my wife about this the other day, and I said before, if I wanted to go to a doctor just for a checkup, I'd get in the car, no matter where the doctor's located, you're talking and drive that's usually an hour with traffic. One way or the other, it's usually an hour with traffic up, an hour with back. And then you're sitting in the office for a half hour or longer in some cases for a 10 minute visit. Nice. We had the technology 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago to do what we're doing now, right. but they wouldn't do it. Right. Schools could have been on doing uh, virtual teaching, remote teaching a decade ago easily. Yeah, but you know, change is a funny beast, isn't it? Yeah. Like that's one of the things that we do at Kadabra, which is the company that I partially own, I'm the principal consultant, and we we do like so we help companies and leaders expand what's possible. So we do really deep transformational leadership development, and then we also do the what I think of as like anything under the culture umbrella. So purpose and values. If you are a purpose-driven company, I can tell you the data from the last 20 years just shows that you will outperform the so-called competition by as much as 14 times by being purpose-driven. But you have to actually live the values that define the purpose, right? right. So that's one. The other, there's three aspects of, of culture. The second one is innovation and how do you deal with change management, which as you might expect is uh, we're getting lots and lots of inquiries about right now. And then the third is around um, inclusion and belonging. And how do you create a culture where everyone feels like, oh, this is this is home, I, belo I belong here. And you know, as we were discussing before, we before I hit the record button, basically, those are points that are really interesting to me and I'm sure really interesting to people listening or watching. I really want you to unpack those 
three or four core offerings that you were just mentioning, um, how they're different and how they benefit that typical small business, if there is such a thing as a typical small business? Uh, yes and no, there is. <laughs> so we have to, we have to be um, careful as small business owners not to fall prey to uh, what one of my clients called terminal uniqueness, which is the idea that nobody has the same challenges that I have. Right. And on, and on one hand, that's true. But on the other hand, or I'll say, and on the other hand, from a biz dev perspective, and, and my 16 years in corporate were all spent doing business development. So that's like, but I come by it honestly. Um, but there's, you know, there are, and I'm sure you see this in the digital world too, there are, you know, foundational pieces that need to be in place in order for a business to thrive. Yes, yes, absolutely. If there's yep. no if there's no foundation, there's nothing to build on. Right, exactly. And and that's that's the biggest problem that I always see is that you have disconnected uh, efforts that they're they're not connected to a larger plan. So we're throwing strategies, which is I guess the metaphorical rice at the wall. They're just throwing that to then see what will stick, and right. they're not connected to a larger whole. Right, because they're being they're just constantly reactive instead of being responsive. And in order to be responsive, you have to take that pause first, which is what I'm suggesting that folks do right now, is just whew, take a breath, you know, just like really sit with, how are you doing? How's your emotional being right now? Because one of the things that we see over and over, and, and this is, I would say, the, of all the work that we do at Kadabra, um, helping leaders become more self-aware is the linchpin. Yeah, it's not a small task. Not at all. I mean, because there's, uh, Tashi is a, a researcher. She found that 95% of people think that they're self-aware, but only 10 to 15% actually are. So we run around thinking, oh yeah, I'm very self-aware. I know myself. And, and but if you ask your partner or your employees, they'll be like, mm, not so much. So how do we take these different parts and kind of apply it to the small business so that there's not so much dysfunction and so much going on? Because you had negative experiences, as you indicated. I certainly have. And um, I'm sure everybody listening or watching has as well, where we've had supervisors or managers, or we work with CEOs who were just detestable or just inefficient. And they're, uh, I forget what the term is, where you're promoted to more and more inefficiency. Peter principle. Yeah, just in incredible. And it's usually the, it's usually family owned businesses, the sons, the nephews, the cousins, the relatives, they're all in these positions that they had no formal education for. And it's, it, that's extremely prevalent in marketing agencies, in addition to the racism and the sexism and, and everything on that goes on. So I want to kind of unpack the different things that you offer, but also see, you know, how can we take these things and really apply it to the small business? Because, I mean, the, problem, the mom and pop company is going to be resistant to change. They don't know where to begin. And in all fairness, not all small business owners are resistant to change. Um, you know, I don't have a problem saying that, but many are, or they just don't have the resources or the organization. They don't know where to begin. How do you dig into that? Where do you begin? Yeah, well, I would say, first of all, it's not just business owners, it's human nature yeah. to resist change. We were hardwired to sort for sameness and in the limbic system, sameness is safe. It's very and tribal. It's very, very tribal. Yeah. It's, you know, 80,000 years of evolution and our limbic system has not caught up with the modern day. Like it's still 
worrying about the rival tribal member or the saber tooth tiger, you know, so we've got these highly activated nervous systems. And then you put a global pandemic, two global pandemics, really, I consider the, the racism that has just flared into a raging wildfire here in the United States, like I, I consider that another pandemic, you know, so mm -hmm. we've got anything, anything that, that the human experience hasn't had before, which unless you're over 100 years old, none of us have experienced a, a global pandemic like this, you know, so that's going to shut, put us into um, what Christine Comerford calls critter state you know, where we're just hunking down, we're, we're making decisions from the, the reptilian part of the brain, which is only about staying alive. And what we really want to do, and in order to help folks get more comfortable with change, is we've got to shift that thinking from the limbic system in the back of the brain to the prefrontal cortex, where mm -hmm. all of our smart thinking happens. Right. And that's where taking that step back. Yeah, taking that comes, pause. Comes in. I remember um, I grew up around a lot of military bases, and I remember a lot of military people would always say that. And they were really big on acronyms. And I remember one guy uh, telling me, I think it was the STOP acronym. Or, I forget what it stands for now. I'd have to Google it. But it was all about really pausing to reassess. Yeah. You know, am I reacting here or am I really making – uh informed decisions you know. right yeah and i think just asking yourself that one question can really help unravel all of the the fear and the uncertainty and the the stasis where we're just stuck we're not doing something different even though what we've been doing especially now is no longer working that's why i said that the foundation of all of the work that we do is around helping leaders become more self-aware because the more self-aware you are, the more you'll notice when you're activated, when you're like, you notice like, oh, wh why my heart's racing? Why is that? Or, well, I, I can't focus. I'm, I've got this project that I'm supposed to be working on and I'm on social media and I'm answering texts and I, oh, all of a sudden I got to take my dog for a walk. Like what, those are all signs that are, amygdala in the limbic system is hijacking our, our rational thoughts. So when we help leaders become more self-aware, and that's the, the foundation of emotional intelligence, really. So the best leaders that we see are the ones that have a high degree of emotional intelligence. Just the ability to like be self-aware, to be able to manage your own emotions, and then to be aware of what's happening around you and to, to have this kind of social awareness so that you notice when your partner comes home, like, oh, are you okay? You don't look right. Or, or an employee comes into work and it's clear that they're upset about something like that. You'll take a pause and say, are you okay? I just want to check in on you as a human being. Yeah. I always <laughs> thought it was being observant and tuned in, you know, um, I always noticed that. And, Every agency that I worked at, maybe one or two exceptions, I always noticed that. that you would always feel as though you were a cog in a machine. And very, it was very impersonal, um, very separate from the actual people running the business. Right. So this is actually a paradigm shift that we're in, David. It's this, the, the shift from what we know of as capitalism today, which is very extractive, it's it's very damaging, it's very focused on short-term goals, yeah. forget the long-term stuff. And it, it sees the humans that are creating value for the organization as cogs in a machine. Now, when you flip conscious capitalism, which is about being purpose-driven, it's having conscious leaders, um, conscious culture, and a full stakeholder orientation. So not just shareholders, but anyone and anything that is impacted by your organization is considered a stakeholder, right? Those companies actually don't buy into the organization as a machine paradigm. They actually believe that every organization has an innate intelligence to it. 
And it's the job of the leaders to tune in to what is the, what's the best and highest expression that we can do in this work right now. And there's so many different layers to that. Oh yeah. yeah. That, and that's what really interests me is where does that all begin? I mean, how do you even break that down? Where does diversity training fit into that? Where does project management fit into that? Yeah. How do you take that apart and then yeah. put it back together again? Right. So um, multi, multiple, multiplicity of answers there, but um, my brain can track all that. I, I, I mean, if I can interject really briefly, yeah. if it's okay. Sure. I mean, like I've been around so many marketing agencies and that's not at all like every type of business it's very very different very unique in, in and of itself so i mean with a marketing agency you've got in some cases like 10 people so you could go in there and just say you've got this c-suite level then you've got this level then you've got these people and they're not talking you could go back and forth between them fairly quickly yeah. but on a larger level like a government agency or something i wouldn't know where to begin yeah, well, the same place, only it takes an awful lot longer. So I think it starts with how, how it starts is with the owner or the CEOs, if it's, you know, multi-generational and, and they've gone outside and gotten a, a different CEO. It's whoever's in charge of the organization has a, this moment, I think of it as like a moment of reckoning, like there's got to be more than making money. I started or my ancestors started this company for a reason. We had a vision of a better world in some way, shape or form. Even if it's just like our little corner of the world, you know, that, that we might, you know, we want, let's say I'm a mm. corner grocer. Like I want the people in my community to have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Like that's a beautiful purpose. Oh, absolutely. You know, you know, and then so so it does take at the very top, regardless of ownership, is the leader's desire to think about the legacy they want to leave, to think about what is the pur purpose beyond just profit. Now, profit will come inevitably if you focus on purpose. And that's, I think people get a little confused. They're like, oh, I can't focus on purpose because I've got to worry about profit. No, 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 it's backwards. Like when you really focus on purpose and you walk your talk and you identify your values and you figure out how do we operationalize these values, which is one of the things we help companies with. Like how, do, how would a customer know that we are living our values of integrity, inclusion, empathy, uh, efficiency, you know, like how would our, our companies, how would our employees know that we are actually living our values? So that's where it starts at that level. And then, then it takes a particular, maybe not for a 10 person company, mm. but for a little bit, like even 50, right? You've got like, you know, you got the people the new hires or the folks who don't have seniority who are like, yeah, is this the flavor of the month? Are they going to forget about it in two weeks? Like you've got to really do the work yeah. to show your team that, that you're serious about this. And you have to hold them accountable to do that work. And I, I don't, I mean, yes. I'm sure that's not in all cases, but. No, it is in all cases. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. It, it has been in my experience and a lot, some of what you're saying actually reminds me of branding where you'd work with a company to try to establish what are your core offerings, what is your message, who are your ideal uh, consumers right. with, with NPOs. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting because you've got to unpack that. You have to do that work or you can't do this. I don't want to call it lower level work, but like you said, a lot of these, a lot of people will look at this, and say this is earthy crunchy you know pie in the sky stuff about getting in touch with our feelings we need to increase profit and they don't see the connection right and you know and it's really key it really is key and you know yes i, I understand that it can come across as 
touchy feely, earthy, crunchy. And we've got so much data. Now I'm a storyteller more than a data geek, but when I first found out about conscious capitalism, my very first question was, why doesn't everybody operate like this? This just makes good sense. And over the years, you know, it's been like seven years since that book came out. Like, I think at this point, I kind of feel like it's willful ignorance on the part of leaders because of this whole idea that change is hard, yes, right? which I disagree with. Well, they, they either don't see the connection and they might even buy into, oh yeah, I'd love to be purpose-driven, but I don't know how to get from here to there. And it's for, just transparently, it's really hard to do that on your own because you can't see the water you're swimming in. You can't see what your culture is like Um, You know, even if you've got exit interviews and you interview all the people that are quitting your company, like, are they really going to be invested in telling you the truth? No, you've got to have an independent, objective third party come in and do a culture assessment and say, you know, here's the good news. Here's the areas that you're really knocking it out of the park. And here are some things that might be blind spots, right? This and, and this is what we would suggest you do to change that to improve it. Um, One of the things that that we do with companies that is probably, I mean, I love all of what I do, but probably my most favorite, because I'm a weirdo and I love change. Like I thrive on newness. And and I realize that like maybe 2% of the population is like that. (laughs) But you know, you got to use your gifts, right? So, So I love working with senior leadership teams and helping them, uh, get we call it just get on get comfortable being uncomfortable and the only way to get comfortable with change is to practice doing things differently and you know we do it i like to say we do it with training wheels and guardrails so nobody gets hurt there's no holes below the water line but we in very low stakes environments help them work together to make decisions faster to prototype faster to to just like get out of their own habitual way of thinking and then what happens is so cool is that they start to like monitor each other and they'll they'll start once they've done this a a bit they'll be like hey david um that sounds like a limiting belief or that sounds like that sounds like something that you've been saying for the last 10 years, is that really still true? Yeah, asking those heavy questions, I think. Yeah, but you teach, you you put them in an environment where the questions don't feel heavy because the stakes are really low. Right, and I say heavy, I mean more meaningful. Right, right. I don't mean like like stressful, but they have more meaning attached to them and they're heavy in the sense that they kind of bring about introspection. Yes. Now, one of the things I wanted to ask you was, I I don't know about other people, but I see all the time, lean management this, lean management that. Now, I think I'm pretty sure what lean management is, but what does it mean to you? Because to me, I think lean management is running a startup basically making things work on multiple levels, kind of a lean, just really, really focusing on efficiency. Yeah, and lean and agile, um, you know, slight difference between the two, but similar enough that they both, the the idea is to increase innovation and get to an MVP, a minimal, minimum viable product as quickly as possible and then market test it. Like, you know, so I, I have coached thousands, literally thousands of small business owners over the course of my career here. It's been 16 years, 16 years as, as a coach. And e- even before I declared myself a business coach, I was helping people with their business. Right. And so, so it's like the idea and see so many people there like ready, aim, aim, aim up, not ready. Okay. Ready, aim, aim. And they never fire. 
right? So lean and agile are about ready, aim, fire, ready, aim, fire, ready, aim, fire. And with each time you do it, you take the data, you take what you've learned. And so you can refine the target that much more the second time. And then you right. take, but you have to get out to market, right? You've got to, like, you can't just like the whole self-awareness thing that we were first talking about, like you can't see how self-aware you are as a human. Like you have to have that reflected from other people. And I think the same is like, that's the basis of lean and agile is like, you've got to get your work reflected back to you by other people. Yeah, I think that's very important. Otherwise you don't have anyone objective uh, looking at it and reviewing it. And they'll, inevitably they'll see things that you can't see. Um, right. It's like there's an old saying that you can't see yourself when you're in the frame, I think, or something like that. You can't see yourself when you're when you're still in the picture. You have to yeah. take a step back yeah. or, or get an objective opinion. If I'm working on a course, I can't. I'm not always going to pick up the grammatical errors or, you know, my wife might look at it and go, you know, I really I really think if you separated this into three points instead of saying it in just one Right. You know, especially for those of us who have a degree of expertise in our field, like we forget, like we've probably forgotten more about our craft than most people even know. You know, yes. so you really have to break it down and, and use, um, to use a Zen term, beginner's mind. Like, how would you, ex and I'm constantly asking people, how would you explain this to a nine year old? And if you can't explain it to a nine-year-old, then you don't really understand it. Short, simple, direct, and very, very clear. Right. What do you do? How do you do it? What is this about? Why am I doing this? Why does it matter? Right. It should always be refined and, and down to its, its innermost core. So how do you take team building well, I should say team building in single one on one help or I don't want to say counseling, coaching. No, it's, coach, it's coaching. It's not counseling. How, yeah. How do you take those two and bring those into a company from the beginning? I mean, do you talk to the management first and then say identify who you think needs this or do you say, we can look at things more objectively. We'll come in and do a needs analysis. Yeah, how really do, how does that work? It really depends on, you know, whoever's on the other end of the phone, like what they think their needs are. And sometimes what they think they need is not what they really need. But um, if they if they come to us and say, you know, we've got a new leader in the C-suite, they've never had a C-suite job before, and they're just in the weeds and they can't get out. And we really mm. need someone to coach them to have that bigger picture C-suite kind of thinking. Um, we'll start there. And what we've noticed over the years is that it, it almost doesn't, almost doesn't matter where we start with the single exception that there has to be a champion in the senior leadership team. Yes. Okay, so we, we had one experience where we were working with an automotive parts manufacturer and we were asked to go in at the middle management level to help them with team building and leadership development. And, and at that level, it worked brilliantly. But what happened is as they tried to manage up to the senior leadership team, the senior leadership team was sort of of the mind of, oh, they need it, we're good here. Right. And so the middle management got really discouraged. And so that experience that was, you know, when I first started, um, that made me kind of draw a line in the sand and say, if we don't have a champion at the C-suite level, it's just not going to work. But yeah. we also, we also do a lot of times we are called in because there is an identified dysfunction in the team. Okay. And so, and it can be anything lately. It's a lot about diversity and inclusion, but it really could be anything. And so we are an authorized Wiley partner. So we use the everything disc model. 
which is a personality assessment that is based on observable traits. So we love it because it's really accessible. Once you get like the initial training on what the model looks like, it's pretty easy to identify what type someone is. And then you get, then you've got the information. Okay. If this person is a, a D, which is a director style, they're very, they can be very abrupt. They're very mm. to the point. They, you know, there's a lot of CEOs are like this, although it's, you, you can be very successful as a CEO and not be a D style. But if, if you're somewhere else on the spectrum, you'll know like, oh, okay, I might want to give them all the background information on how I came to this conclusion, but I know that all they want to hear is the conclusion and they'll trust me that I've done my, my background work. So we'll start with that and, and often also a culture assessment, which is a pretty, I mean, it's like 15, 10 to 15 questions, depending on what the subject is. And so we do a survey and then we follow up with um, either focus groups or um, a cross section of one-on-one -on -one interviews throughout the entire organization. And then we take our findings and we report back and based on whatever our findings are, we will outline what we think the next best, best steps are. Do you think that most of the businesses that you talk to we are reflecting back what's going on in society today or is it the other way around that what's going on in society is is causing that you know like when you were saying that you're getting more calls today for diversity training is it because of what's what they see on the news or is it something else? Well, I think it's, you know, particularly right after the murder of George Floyd, it was, it was this knee jerk reaction. Oh crap. We have to do something about this. Yeah. It's, because it's been going get, on. Yeah. It's not new. It's, it's not new. It's been going on for over 400 years. Right. And if, and if reading a book or learning about something was going to change, then we wouldn't be in this, predicament in the first place, right? So you've got to actually get in and do the work. And, but you know, an unconscious bias training is not going to solve the problem. It might be that it's part of the solution, but at the end of the day, the diver the diversity issue is not even about diversity. In my opinion, it's about inclusion and belonging. And if I am spending eight, 10, 12 hours a day, in a work environment and I don't feel like my voice matters. And in fact, I feel like when I raise my voice, it's ignored. If I have an idea, I'm looked at like I have three heads. Like, I, am I going to, am I going to be an engaged employee? Absolutely not. You know, so, so I think the quick sort of the quick pulse to find out, do we have an inclusion problem? is to do an employee survey and we work we've got a strategic partner we work with who actually offers the first one for free you know so there's like there's there's no downside well unless you consider having to look at the truth of what's happening that's a company. big downside yeah they don't that like that right. they're not they gonna like be. that but it's not gonna cost you anything i mean i think the thing is it's 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 institutionalized. It's a part of American culture. I mean, quite literally, it's what America was founded upon. America uh, was born on the backs of enslaved people. Yeah, the White on, House was built by them. Yeah. I worked for more marketing agencies than I can even try to remember, more than I want to remember. And I could very easily count on one hand the number of African-American or uh, Latin employees that I've ever seen. Yeah. And the tremendous amount of ageism. Yes. That, On both uh, ends. Both ends of the spectrum with ageism. Yeah. And I mean, I never saw anybody above, if anyone was above the age of 30 or 35, these, those were the owners. Right. Or the, that, that's, that's sort of peculiar to the marketing industry, I think. Yes. <laughs> But I mean, it just seems so much like, how would you ever get through to them so that you could turn 
that place around so that it would actually be enjoyable to work there and some place where you could truly be creative and feel creative, which is a great irony because that's what they want. But usually with most marketing agencies, you go there and you follow orders. Right. Like we, we want you for your creativity, just do things our way. <laughs> right. And it's the same with education. So, I mean, don't, don't get me started on education. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how you could begin to get in there. Well, it's, it's actually, I don't want to say it's easy, but it is relatively simple. People have to understand what's in it for me. Like, why, why do I care about diversity? And what's the impact, the potential impact on my business? And one of the most profound impacts on a business in, that is not inclusive is the, and I call this the so-called hidden cost of high turnover, Mm -hmm. because it's it's black and white it costs 1.4 times the salary of a person to replace them and so if you've got high churn you gotta ask yourself why and the number one reason for high turnover is that people don't feel like they belong i've i've never worked for a marketing or advertising agency where there was not huge turnover yeah it was a given Every, that has to be a red flag. Yeah, and and that's why I'm happy not to work for them anymore. But I think, um, I think just in fact, when I was in marketing, they had a very common practice called farming. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Um, that's where the, the marketing agency would basically have a given day, and it would go into the evening where they would offer free food and company swag and t-shirts and bags and what have you. You could come in and get free pizza, free beer and everything, but they're specifically recruiting. And and that's the reason they're doing it. And they would do it like quarterly. Right. And and if yeah. you went to two or three of those farming events, it'd be completely different people. And I remember when I was in college, I would go to these farming events for the free food. In some cases, I'd go and give them my resume. But after working for two or three agencies like that, I didn't want to go because I realized if, that... if, you have, if you have to build something like that into your business model, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. And I, and I do understand that a marketing agency or an advertising agency that values creativity so profoundly, I could understand the, the fallacy that they need new blood. Okay, but they don't need new blood. They need to encourage and allow the innate creativity of the good people that are already working for them. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And by doing that, you decrease turnover, you save money. Save a ton of money. And saving a ton of money is the same thing as making a ton of money. And exactly. I think a, a lot of businesses don't want to see that. Right. Um, but what? then there's just one more one more piece on that Absolutely. is when you've got an engaged a happy workforce engaged employees they are your best marketing like they yeah. are gonna bring customers to you so i think when when leaders don't think about that they're just you know kind of cutting off their nose to spite their face yeah i i agree and even just a compliment or you know, I remember there was one agency, I won't say which, what, it, what the name of it was, but um, it was probably one of what you would call like a, a boiler room marketing agency. It was maybe like 10 people and they had other offices and other uh, um, floors. But where I was, there was about 10 people on that floor. And I remember the, the main person in charge, the president of that marketing company was on our floor. He would curse, he would shout profanities, expletives. You didn't even want to go near him. But every once in a while you would do something, he would come over and he'd say, that white paper you wrote was great. I love it. Here's a gift certificate for $50. Take a two or three hour lunch, get whatever you want on the company or take the company credit card, go out for lunch, don't do anything else. Just go out for lunch, get whatever you want. 
and uh, you know you can mess around the rest of the day or whatever that was great and instead of wanting to leave the company because of the expletives and the other treatment that you didn't like you would get these sporadic events that say all right i'll give it another six months yeah typical that is classic pavlovian uh training you yeah know, you, you give the it's they can't tell when it's coming but they'll put up with all sorts of abuse because there's a cookie there somewhere <laughs> Yeah, and I think I stayed with that company probably for two or three years. I learned an awful lot from them. I mean, I'd be the first to say that. I learned a tremendous amount from working with them. But like you said, when I realized that I was on that Pavlovian cookie train, um, I just said, yeah, I think I can find something that's a little bit more calm and a little bit more mature, where you don't have someone throwing things across the room and everything. <laughs> that's talk about back to the limbic system like that's going to activate yeah. your nervous system yes and it did have to duck, you know so, and that's just not a healthy that's why i say like we are not going back to normal we don't want any new normal because the way we were operating has been profoundly unhealthy and yeah. i actually really believe that companies if companies want to be successful in the next 10 years they are going to have to be purpose-driven they're going to have to focus on inclusion. They're going to have to get better at innovation and, and being okay with making mistakes because this, the way we've been operating, I think what COVID did is it ripped the covers off of all the other diseases that were happening in society. And you can see yeah. some, some countries have fared very well their underlying diseases were maybe not there or maybe just like a small cold. But in America, it ripped off the covers and there's the disease of white supremacy, there's the disease of racism, there's sexism, ableism, like we've got this, you know, all of these behaviors that can be directly tracked back to a system of white supremacy, like perfectionism and defensiveness and either or thinking the the rugged individualist like all of those are it's a dying system it's so, not sustainable it's not sustainable yeah. at all and look at i mean just look at what we've done to the planet it's like we've got to reverse course really quickly and so for the leaders out there who are listening to this podcast like if you're not purpose driven i'm not saying you have to like hire us to help there's lots of folks who do purpose work there's so much work to be done like i could refer people out all day long and and still trust that i would have plenty of work but figure out like what are your values what is your your purpose beyond just making profit like why did you start this business what is the world that you want to see do you start there do you think america's small businesses are ready for this challenge really that COVID is bringing or has brought? Yeah, I'm gonna say yes and no to that. You know, I saw a stat that said up, upwards of 40% of small businesses won't survive COVID, which and, is heartbreaking. Yes, and so I remember I was a, a certified small business mentor for an organization called SCORE. I'm sure oh, yeah. you've heard of them, a yeah. division of the U.S. Small Business Administration. Now, I remember a long time ago, I think it was always 95 or 99 percent of all small businesses would go under. In the first three, five years, yeah. three to five years. yeah. So now that number is probably much higher. Yeah. So I think the ones who will make it and who will truly thrive through it, I think there's a few characteristics they'll have in common. Uh, the first, as I said, is that they've got a purpose. And that, that sense of having a higher purpose is really the thing that gets you through the hard times. Yeah. Like I can't give I can't give up on on this work because I am committed to changing the face of capitalism to create a just and equitable economy. Like that's that's my bigger why. Okay. That's like I have a bad day I can snuggle with my dog and back at it tomorrow because of that higher purpose. I also think that the idea of, so two other things, 
the idea of um, cooperation. So cooperate, it's kind of a combination of cooperating and competition. I don't believe in a competitive model. I think there is plenty out there for everyone, particularly if you've got a unique perspective, a unique way of offering, like there's so, so many opportunities here. But if we are like, I was just listening to a podcast around the, um, the food and beverage industry in mm -hmm. New York City, right, which has been complete, I mean, just the food and beverage industry has been completely decimated by COVID. Yeah. And, and so the ones that come back or rise from the ashes will be the ones that do one of two things. They support each other. Yes. Like we're in this together. Like, how can I help you help me? How can you help me help you? And then the other thing is that they've, they've, um, they've really got to put on the, they've got to embrace this idea of innovation and thinking outside the box and how, how can we reimagine something that we've always done? There was just, I live in the Silicon Valley Bay area and there was just something on the news last night or the night before that, um, so there's, and I know this is not everybody's cup of tea, but there was this drag queen show in San Francisco that was hugely popular, like 35 years at, at running, they, they would do these, drag shows with uh, dinner. And of course that disappeared on March 13th here in the Bay Area. And, but they've, oh. what they've done is they've partnered with a couple, a mom and pop company that makes handmade like gourmet meals. And they've partnered with this drag shop to do a delivery service where for like 195 bucks, I think it is, you can get a, a gourmet meal delivered to your door mm -hmm. and a drag show on I the street. I think that's great. I remember in Denver, Colorado, there was a place, I think it was called Hamburger Mary's. If I got it wrong, please don't hold it against me or send me some nasty email. But I remember there was a place where they would, uh, and my wife took me there. And I think she wanted to see how I was going to respond. You got to be very secure in who you are. And I remember going there and there was, I think it was just, the food was okay. It was, it wasn't spectacular. Again, but you'd have drag queens would come and serve you and everything. And I remember I was sitting there and the drag queen coming over. I'm thinking, she's got a goatee and sideburns. I wonder what happened. And, you know, and we started talking and it was just, it was fun. It gets you out of that mindset of everything being so partitioned right. and i didn't care it wasn't a big deal because yeah. like they're, they're not I'm, hitting on you it's it wouldn't it wouldn't change who i am right. regardless anyway i'm not going to turn into a, a, a turtle or something or whatever it's not going to change who you are so you got to be very secure but um i it's think even if you're not secure though that like doing something outside of your comfort zone, like it's, maybe not related to business. Maybe you, um, you know, I took a trapeze class once, a flying trapeze class. It was I got some of the most amazing less, like life lessons from that experience. That is brave. That is brave. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. But you know what you were- Safety net and hooking yeah. in, like there was no way of getting hurt. That's actually what I was, I was gonna say, when I was in college and I was in better shape, I took Aikido and I loved it very much. And the philosophy of that touches on what you were saying earlier about cooperating. That, and, I, and I remember that's what really blew my mind about it, that I really loved so much was this other person in front of you is not an opponent. That person is your partner. And I remember there was a, a time where we're doing a, a routine, we're re you know, re rehearsing it, we're doing it over and over again, so you can try to memorize it and do it instinctively. And this was like 20 years ago, so I don't remember how to do it. But I remember this guy was twice my size. I was like 6'2", 240 back then, much heavier. And he was like twice my size. And so the instructor, this tiny little Japanese guy with a bamboo stick, and he's like, okay, now, 
this person here is going to throw you around his hip and you're going to land properly so you don't hurt yourself. Okay, hi, yes, sensei. Then you're going to do it to him. And so we're doing it back and forth. And I made a mistake and I got, I, he threw me, I got up, I'm like, oh, that really hurt, you know. And he came over to me and he said, if you throw me that way and I, the wrong way, he said, I could break a finger or I could dislocate a shoulder or something and I can't have that happen. And I'm going to be really upset, which I'm not supposed to be in Aikido class. I'm not going to blow you kisses. I'm going to be really upset. And I thought, okay, whoa, 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 sorry, dude. Let's go through it again more slowly so I can learn from you because you're more experienced. And that way I can do it more correctly and we can keep practicing on that because I really a, do want to learn it. And, you know, let, let's go ahead and do that. But I loved the way that it wasn't in your face. It wasn't contrapuntally opposed to you. Right. You're working with this other person back and forth in order to achieve something different. And I've always loved it. I always loved Aikido for that. And have always loved, you know, Buddhism and gotten more into that. That's why I always have that on my wall yeah. to kind of keep me as a reminder. Yeah. You know, so I see that, you know, reflected back, you know, chill out, stay calm, focus. But it's that whole thing of in marketing, we used to call it piggybacking, where you, you work cooperatively with businesses because they, if you don't have something that one party wants, there's always a way to work cooperatively. And I guess my, my, my final question for you would be, why don't more businesses do that? It just seems so obvious. They just don't seem to be receptive or they don't think about it. It's because of the system of white supremacy they grew up in, which is all about competition. Only one person can win. The rugged individualist. Like, wow. It's like, it's how we're raised. It's how we're schooled. Like even the, the grading system in school, like if you fail more than 30% of the time, that's not good like and that's yeah. not reality right so we really it's really about unraveling and dismantling the the symptoms that we don't we're not even aware of but they're running us and i, I always say that white supremacy is incredibly harmful for every single one of us including white men and i think you did a really i think you really said something that i haven't heard anybody put it in the uh, that light before where you said the whole thing about how it affects you and you don't know it but on a you know it, it impacts you on these multiple levels that you would not otherwise see yeah and and that's a really really um, very important observation yeah it's really about i think at the end of the day um so i i have this like way of seeing the world. I call it Vista Vision. Like, like I just see things. I see how they connect. And, and what I'm seeing right now is that we are in the midst of, or the very beginning of, a paradigm shift. I hope so. From, from scarcity. <laughs> there's not enough, so I've got to try to grab every little bit that might be mine, to sufficiency, where we recognize that there is plenty for all of us if we work together and we don't have to extract more than what we need because we understand. So there's this like relaxing into trust or faith that there's more where that came from. And if you can relax like that, if you can embrace that mindset, A, you're not in that competitive mindset. Exactly. It's, it's not us against them. And it's not, hey, if you don't churn and burn, I'm going to have to let you go. Maybe I could sit down and say, what's impacting? What's happening? Yeah. What's like, is everything okay at home? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And or, that's what good managers do. Right. And they work with you. I'll never forget there was one agency I worked at. And it really, really hit me right between the eyes. There was a guy who came in. He was a nice enough person. I mean, everybody could get along with him just fine. He did what needed to be done. But you could always smell that liquor on his breath. And one day he came in, totally 100% true. I mean, this happened more than one occasion, but this was one day he's sitting there 
He's sitting at his desk, and all of a sudden you hear a boom. And I look over and I'm thinking, what was that? Did he drop something? Did he drop a cup of coffee? And his head was right there in front of the monitor. Boom. And um, so I saw that and I said, I hate to do this, but I better go say something. Because A, he's not gonna he's not gonna churn and burn, that's for sure. Um, and so I, I better go say something because it could be something really wrong with him. So I went to go get someone in higher seniority and just said, you know, here's what's going on with the, this nice gentleman. Um, it's on you what you want to do. I don't. I'm not going to handle it. I don't have the. I don't have the seniority. I don't have the authority to handle it. I need you to do something. And so anyway, they they did talk to him, and they actually told him if you go to AA meetings and you bring us back the um, their certificate or the coupon or the paper to indicate that you went, we'll give you, uh, I think it was 30 day probation or something. But if you keep yeah. going and you give us this, you'll be fine. Yeah. It, and they offered to drive them home. They yeah. offered to drive them home that day, which I, th I thought was very reasonable. That's a, that's a really human way to address something. And my question is, what <laughs> kind of pressure was that poor man under? Yeah, we don't want to know. You know, we, you know, we can yeah. only imagine. I know it was a high stress agency job where we all had to deliver a tremendous amount of marketing collateral on a daily basis. We had all kinds of deadlines yeah. and I'm sure that was eating away at them. Yeah. And we don't all, we're not all as, we're not all evenly resourced based on what happens to us in our childhood, what kind of traumas we experience. And you have you know, bad days too. And we have bad days. We do know that alcoholism can be hereditary you know so it's, it's yeah. just like really just look at the human first so but that's what just to kind of recap what i would say for companies business owners that want to thrive during and post covid is like identify your higher purpose get really good at cooperating and collaborating and think outside the box and not just you but encourage your employees to think outside the box too. So have, you know, one of the things we recommend is have like a, um, an anonymous suggestion box. Yes. Okay. And you can put both really things that you think are really good and things that you think are horrible. So you kind of make a game of it and you could, you could do it like even saying, um, you know, what would be the way we could guarantee this project would not succeed and you know throws throws so you might say all right everybody this week this is the project we're working on we want a suggestion from everyone on how to sabotage it you know not because you're going to sabotage it right. but because you're wanting them to think outside the box you know yeah i think that's a great idea and i think that would be a really helpful policy and it has to be once you do it stick to it and really do well, it and, you know. yeah and if you're going to do that particular thing then you take all the ideas of how to sabotage and you look at is there anything that we're doing right now that even remotely resembles these suggestions yeah and then you can stop doing that thing yeah so. absolutely well, I think uh, this was a very constructive conversation, and I really, really appreciate your time. Johanna, how can people get in touch with you to learn more? Yeah, they can uh, find me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So it's linkedin.com slash in slash Johanna Lyman, J-O-H-A-N-N-A-L-Y-M-A-N. And they can go to our website, uh, We Are Kadabra with a K dot com and uh bear with us that website is we're in the midst of a rebranding process so it's not the the newest and final but you can see a little bit about what we're up to there well that sounds great and thank you again for your time please stick around with me for another minute or two if you if you don't sure. mind and sure. we're going to end this episode of rebooting business thank you for watching or listening if this episode has been helpful to you uh, please consider subscribing or give, giving us a positive review. And thank you again for watching or listening. Stay safe, everybody.
You've been listening to Rebooting Business, the podcast for, about, and by America's small business owners who are ready to reboot and rebuild businesses in a post-COVID-19 world. To learn more about rebooting your business or be a guest on the podcast, please visit www.dms.blue today.